Good evening. On the wall of the subway station at 59th and Lexington, a message scratched in the concrete wall reads, the difficulty with running away is you have to take yourself along. Can you confirm that street corner admonition for us, Mr. Bell? Wait, you'll have your turn. An enduring speculation in the architecture discourse concerns the interdependence of the architect's city as he finds it and the architect's city as he leaves it. How might the physical and cultural geography of a city predetermine the conceptual content of what the architect builds there? There are those who argue that each city's cultural landscape is a specific form determinant. That is, location prefigures future content, and content reaffirms the pro forma of a particular location. But the reciprocal is also plausible. <coughs> content, on occasion, contests the pro forma of place and reimagines it. In either case, in either case, no Vienna, no Nover, no Holine, no Bricks. No New York, no Mumford, no Eisenman. No Barcelona, no Gaudi, no Mirais. And of course, we can never account for the architect's history, the architect's history omits, who refused to confirm and were unable to deny the urban geography they encountered. There's an operational corollary to the place content paradigm. Once the architect's pro forma is initiated, refined, and practiced in a particular place, it remains conceptually intact wherever on the globe it is subsequently deposited. Here's the chronology. First the city makes the architect, next the architect makes the city. Finally the architect makes other cities as if the other cities were the city that, made, that first made the architect. In the current lexicon that's globalization. Ergo, Khan in Bangladesh is Khan in New Haven, or Le Corbusier in Firmini is Le Corbusier in Chandigarh. So how does the Michael Bell model ratify the place content thesis? It doesn't. Bell's the antithesis, or the antithesis. He's the exception that confirms the rule that confirms he's the exception. Bell is a dislocation architect, content as abstract, divorced from place, perpetually on the run. His venue is kinetic, a cultural geography misfit. There's no Bell exegesis that extrapolates from a particular city of residence to design content and back. Bell arrives, he works, he departs, leaving his furniture and his speculations behind. A unique career path produces an evolving perspective that belongs to, then disowns the a priori intellectual content of his work. There's often an experimental period in the life of experience of an architect, a time of I don't know, replaced by a time of maybe I've got it, replaced in some cases by a time of redundancy, do and redo. Bell is a subscriber to steps one and two only, and his modus operandi suggests an important option for all of us. Bell left the West Coast and disowned the Gulf Coast, and an East Coast departure is likely to be next. Bell's a man from the city where no one else lives, and Cyark's a perfect fit for that misfit. The pre-modern and post-digital Bell is tolling. Please welcome Michael Bell to Cyark.
say anything. Um, it's pretty typical at uh, Columbia for people to claim that Mark Wigley's uh, introductions are better than the lecture, but I think there's a new standard set here for their lecture. So, introduction. Thank you. Um, it, it will fail. Uh, I am taken aback, but thank you. And, uh, I, I was at Berkeley for uh, as a student and then as a part-time faculty member for 11 years. At Rice for six years, I've been in Columbia for 10. So I do move, but uh, I tend to stay a while anyway. It's a, it's a story. Um, uh, one of the key themes in the talk tonight is the Robert Smithson term non-site. So Eric, your talk is, your introduction is more, more fitting than you might have known. Uh, I'm not going to explain this first slide. I'm, I'm going to try to talk tonight about what it means to be an architect in relationship to cities, and uh, in particular in relationship to designing houses and housing. Uh, I will end with a house. I'm going to start with two housing projects in all, just so three projects tonight. Uh, the sequence should be pretty rapid, but frankly, I'll go a little bit deeply into each, and that might take a little while. Uh, this slide I will come back to. If you were reading it uh, while, while we were beginning, you, you probably have got some of it already in your imagination. But you're seeing three tiers of information here that I think would be up to the moment issues for an architect working today in cities and around housing. The first uh, is, of course, the, 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 the undoing of structured finance, and you can follow that yourself without me going into it. Uh, the second, social and political will, the questions of the kind of thinking uh, politically and socially that goes behind housing, how it has been imagined early on in the 20th century in 1937 to be exact, and how it's imagined today. And finally, questions about the role of not just emerging economies and emerging nations in relationship to the United States, but essentially everything that column is discussing a scenario where, as the United States finds itself re-examining a great deal of its political and social tenets in relationship to architecture and cities, indeed, we find ourselves often able to look at economies and nations where these things are emerging for the first time. In other words, as our systems recede, we can look to other countries who are establishing questions for the first time. Um, I went to uh, Houston, Texas in 1993 as an assistant professor of architecture, and I joined a faculty that was deeply committed to questions of urbanism. I went to Houston really, I think, as an architect, and I went there as an architect, I think, to follow Eric's questions as an architect, really without a city. Uh, in California for 11 years, frankly, I was working through questions of architectural history, and I think I was really working through questions as uh, posited by architects who were not Californians, namely John Haydeck and Peter Eisenman, uh, and questions of the kind of ultimately of an autonomy of architecture from social or political discourse. But upon arriving in Houston and joining a team that I was thrilled to join, uh, the dean was Lars Lehrer, the faculty and the new faculty members that year included Sanford Quinter, Yongho Chang, and myself. And we joined a team that included Albert Pope, who was finishing a book on Houston called Ladders. That I, I often describe that scenario as a situation where a group of neo tiforian architects, uh, a group of people who saw the city as a sort of economic and political nemesis, something to quote Tiforian that humiliated the architect, that was mixing with a stream of thought largely uh, motivated through the writing and thinking of Sanford Quinter, a question where architects would increasingly engage questions of infrastructure, and by that, not necessarily freeways or train tracks, although not disincluding those, but instead a kind of question of the engines that operate beneath cities and the operational techniques that were not necessarily plastic. Depending on how you looked at a city like Houston, you could find moments of a almost sheer humiliation, a kind of exasperating condition that frankly many of us saw as relatable to LA, but without the sunshine, without the beach, without Hollywood, without a history of art and architecture that I think this city has always had, has had for a long time. So this kind of picture of Houston, as opposed to this kind of picture by Lee Friedlander in 1972, Albuquerque, New Mexico, a photograph, uh, this is from a Museum of Modern Art exhibition that included, quote, those poles and trees and stuff, end quote, that other photographers leave out. In other words, looking at Houston through a lens of fragmentation and, frankly, a type of dystopia, not able to really compare it to a photo by Friedlander where that was apparently what we were seeing, but seemed quite quaint in contrast. Um, we also, for those of us that went to Houston in 1993, were enthralled, in some sense, by the experiments that we thought were happening at SciArc, and those of us that didn't teach here had a kind of fantasy of what went on at SciArc in relationship to Los Angeles. But there was a scenario that I think was national, and this is the influence of Mike Davis, 
in the early 1990s and of Andre Corbeau in the 1990s as well. Arch arch authors that in some sense tantalized architects to try to imagine what was being called the contemporary city and to look at the city in some sense with all of its apparent and if not grossly obvious uh, flaws, but also a city that somehow in that extreme produced a sort of foil that essentially baked architecture to try to become compensatory to it. The photograph of Houston on the lower left showing, this is from 1982, you're seeing not a city that was planned to have that many parking lots, but a city where parking lots emerged as buildings were erased after the OPEC oil bust. Another photograph, which I'll come back to later, of the Fifth Ward in Houston, of somebody crossing a street in this relatively small neighborhood. I went to Houston uh, as, as an architect in the sense that I really did just work on buildings and I worked on things that were understood to be normative to architectural discourse throughout the 20th century. And the key issue here would be painting. Uh, from the 1920s up until the 1990s, it was relatively common to link concepts of architectural space to painting space. I, as I move forward tonight, I'd like to try to make a case that given the circumstances today and indeed uh, much of what we know about the last 10 years, to be frank, the role of an architect today at some level is, even as it has aspired to become more urban, and we have in fact, I think, often become quite talented at urban questions, although we are, we are not ultimately a specialist in that regard, it still is a kind of practice that despite its aspirations is quite small and often quite discreet in what, what it can affect. In that regard, I would point back to three paintings and really focus on the one on the far right by Robert Slutsky. These are all paintings that were analyzed in the middle 1980s through lenses of art criticism and art history, but all three of them touched into architectural discourse quite a bit in the 1980s and offered a kind of lens that I think ultimately I'll show tonight in relationship to urbanism. The painting on the far right was called, uh, it's called Untitled. It's one of 14 paintings by the painter Robert Slutsky, who is uh, famous for an architectural essay called Transparency, Literal and Phenomenal, co-written with Colin Rowe in 1964. But well, 54, I take that back. But the, the painting, in the painting, Slutsky discusses uh, what he called an oculus or a counter eye, an eye in the painting that essentially is an antithesis to your own eye and reflects your desire uh, to have a reciprocity with the painting. The oculus, as Slutsky called it, was the same color in the, same, in the 14 paintings as a torus-shaped topological dome that surrounded the painting. And in his writing about these 14 paintings with the critic Joan Ockman, also his wife, they discussed that the oculus turned space inside out like a torus glove. It made figure and field ambiguously one. This is 1984. In 82, uh, you will find writings by Norman Bryson on Raphael's Marriage of the Virgin, by Frank Stella on the painting New York City. In both cases, they essentially describe the white space as proceeding through the foreground of the painting and indeed into the, into the very space you're in. Uh, in the Bryson quote, the oculus in the doorway, it is a drain or a black hole of otherness placed at the horizontal horizon. And in the case of Frank Stella, the painter discussing Mondrian, it is here that Mondrian rattles the bones of human configuration for the last time. Is it, it is here that the white rectangle steps out of the background landscape and into its own space. What I'd like to show tonight is a set of projects that I'll come back to in referring to those paintings. But is it, it's an issue where architecture is testing itself both against art histories, it is testing itself against architectural histories, and ultimately it is testing itself in finding what it can retain versus when it is forced to migrate in relationship to cities and sites. Architecture intention, staging its own disappearance or being disappeared. My early work, um, at fun, fun finishing school myself, now 20 something years ago, was based in those art histories. And I'll show one image, but this is a project from 1992. It was a house designed for the outskirts of Santa Fe, New Mexico, and on the desert for someone who was uh, who had purchased property there and was moving from Northern California. But the Slutsky issues and the ocular issues were there. The architecture was understood as a type of visual experience. It was understood as a project that under a type of topological duress would transform the figure and field of the painting of the occupational space. And to be quite literal about it, you're seeing one building here that is placed across a field behind a building that's in the foreground. It was two small buildings that form one house. 
it, just like the Slutsky work, essentially the background was understood to be elastically pulled through the foreground, and what's progressive and what's recessive was essentially put into a type of uh, ambient flux where one replaces the other. I won't dwell on this type of work tonight, but the diagram for the aspirational model was this model of something called the Klein model, 1959 mathematical model of a, of a bottle without an inside, physically impossible to produce, but mathematically proved by Albert Tucker, the mathematician at Princeton. It's a period of work where I was went through about eight projects where I was trying to test these equations about frontality, depth, and then issues where you could argue that you would take the interior of one volume and manage to perceptually create that experience where the interior seemed to have passed through the exterior and unfolded itself. Upon arrival in Houston, the work was forced to become more urban, or at least to more didactically and experientially try to examine its roots and its site. This site is a site that I eventually worked on as an architect in Houston, where the blankness did not need to be created as an architectural foil or trope. The blankness was indeed everywhere. Downtown Houston in the 1980s and 1990s was still largely evacuated based on normative uh, decentralization issues that most American cities faced. But I refer quite explicitly to the blankness of this type of white wall and the blankness of the empty lot across the street from the property and then finally the high rises in the distance. And again, that picture of Houston. This is Exxon. This is called the Houston House, a little mini Le Corbusier unit de habitation. This is the electric company's public headquarters where you can pay your electric bill. And this is everywhere you can park. <laughs> no one went down. Um, now, during that period of time, uh, just to flip through a few images, uh, I quickly transformed as an architect from, some, from somebody who was designing buildings that had to do with a type of produced optic depth to instead a fascination with some of the materials of Houston, the, the, the low budget curtain walls, the aging curtain walls, and also the flatness and the lack, of, the lack of depth in many of the actual building facades, despite the evacuation of property in the city. This house, designed in 1995, for that site that I just showed you, was producing three different 12 foot wide volumes, one, two, and three. It also had one, two, and three courtyards, and then a large amount of underused property in the back. It was a building that was more negative space than positive space, and it was a building where the transparency never allowed a visual depth that was greater than about 11 feet, a type of flattening of space. Simultaneously, I, would look, I was looking at what Houston was made out of. Uh, I think seven out of 12 buildings in Houston were prefabricated metal buildings, type of Butler buildings, or Whirlwind was the trade company in Houston, looking at ways to use this sort of off-the-shelf, uh, low-level commodity architectural production machine and see what was possible with it, and indeed look at the flatness of it as opposed to the visual depth of the paintings that had inspired me before. So you're seeing here a structural frame from a Butler building, a small amount of forged steel linking to the cold rolled bent metal that we know in these buildings and then the folded uh, skins and then an insertion of low level sliding doors. This was for a painter and a graphic designer. It was a photo studio. And uh, I'm sorry, a graphic design studio and a painting studio. But looking in, in this case increasingly at the little two and three inch increments between sliding doors, levels of transparency and reflectivity, and setting up a scenario where the optic depth was now increasingly compressed into the few inches of the skin, not allowing the type of full-blooded experience of space that these paintings prior had portended. So you're seeing here uh, two levels of sliding glass doors sutured into the Butler building, uh, prefab metal stairs inside, and various systems of prefabrication and color. And these are the building systems. For me, this kind of work was an exploration. It was a period of time where I was essentially trying to look at the economic systems and what they were doing to use them, to use in architecture but also trying to look at them with this deep focus of a kind of architectural line that would take seriously the fact that that rib is one and three quarter inches while this rib is only one half inch. And try to look at these questions and look at the plastic nature of that and see if there are options. It, for the art, it doesn't produce an exciting floor plan if you look at that. Um, on the other hand, uh, the question I think of material that increasingly uh, started to dominate in the built work I'll show later tonight really comes out of this sort of model. You're looking at a photoelastic stress test from the 1930s 
uh, look at this as a structural engineering test, of course, to, to examine the buildup of stress and strain in a model beam. This is a clear, transparent plastic beam that is being tested by loading it here, 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 and here. But by polarizing the light and then photographing this uh, translucent beam through the polarized light, you deal with the spectrum of light waves that's visible and you can see the stress and strain in the beam. This kind of scenario of linking together one sort of optic project where the eye is deeply and instrumentally engineered in terms of what it is able to witness, which we know is part of an engineering practice, of course, but where that sort of optic project from the engineering side is mixed with the volumetric optic project of architecture the way I think most of us are taught. In this case, you're looking at a proposal by Giuseppe Tarandi and Pietro Lingeri for a speaking stand. This was a platform that Mussolini was going to speak from had it been built in front of the Colosseum in Rome. But the photoelastic stress test is actually laced into the final proposal. You're seeing a truss here, a truss here, and a diaphragm wall construction periphery of soft Egyptian stone laced with steel cables that would have traced and revealed the stress and strain in the wall. But at the same time, this is a theater, in essence, to gather the crowd as in a visual and volumetric spectacle that Mussolini would have spoken to after they had gathered. These are Tuani and Jerry's stress test. So looking at a scenario where the project of, of an architectural device that is capable, at some level, of manufacturing its own logics in a very discreet and isolated way, that it starts to become embedded in economic or in engineering systems and, and thereby inculcates itself with those types of logics as well. But at the same time, increasingly, and as I tend to showing housing projects here, starting to look closer and closer at who's occupying it and what kind of things do we know about that person. So all of that work really precedes any real serious speculation about social systems in more direct terms in terms of normative or even realistic ideas of human beings. Instead, it is more still, I think, a kind of theoretical inquiry into our cultural histories. Um, I won't spend time on this, but the, as I go through tonight, I'll refer back to this. We have two Harlequins by Picasso. 1918 at the height of synthetic cubism and 1923 post-cubism. And the scenario that I'll refer to is the degree to which is Picasso's body transforms according to the pictorial logics that he's working with, but also that as you proceed, the later Harlequin is understood through our history lens to actually now be in front of the picture plane rather than behind it. And this kind of sense of increasingly seeing the body and architecture's relationship to the body, who is the, who is the subject of architecture, where are they in relationship to the framing devices that you're working with? And indeed, what is your capability of transforming the experience of somebody in any number of ways? Uh, this is a relatively, uh, oh, this is an overly direct comparison, but photographed by Darren Nemblet of a young woman who we were working with in the Fifth Ward. Her family was getting a house through the project we were running. And looking at the scenario of the seated body, the seated body, and starting to just really try to think hard as we went forward about these questions. My own work in architecture and urbanism followed several paths. While I was designing, I was also trying to work on, on criticism and essays about cities. In 1998, uh, we released a book called Slow Space, which I edited with C. Chung Leong. It included work by colleagues such as Dana Cuff, Robert Mangurian, and Marianne Ray, Lars Lair, uh, Albert Pope, Mark Longo, uh, many others, including Stanley, Stanley Sandler and Stephen Hall. But it was an attempt to look at the city of Houston and also to a large degree LA through the eyes of an architect. And the work increasingly was, a set, was trying to set up a lens through which you could imagine that architecture was in fact still a discrete entity, but that it was laced with these systems. The general hypothesis of the book Slow Space fell along the lines of something like this that despite the visual apparent, uh, the apparent visual incoherence of cities such as Houston and the ease by with which you could call it fragmented, the cities were in that indeed actually exceedingly coherent if you looked at them through the economic engines and the motors that produced them. 
So if you look through the lens of a speculative housing developer in terms of what they actually were trying to achieve, you would in fact find systems of deep coherence. You would not find systems of architectural coherence or urban coherence if you examine the negative spaces and the way these buildings, these systems essentially produce urban non-sites to borrow the word from Robert Spissa. Later on, and the title of the lecture tonight, which I'll tend towards engineering transparency, and increasingly in my work is a kind of configuration where I'm trying to look more at the way in which deep engineering practices linked to deep financial practices are still actually producing similar effects, meaning that even though a building by Sejima and, and uh, Asana may look far more architecturally significant in terms of its aspirations and indeed its success in the way it controls as relatively ancient architectural goals, it too is bathed in the most discrete and instrumental of systems that to a large degree are incapable of touching the wider field, or at least are testing those limits. I'll come back to that. Uh, Engineer Transparency was a conference at Columbia last year. It's one of three conferences over three years that I've organized and directed, uh, bringing together state-of-the-art architects and engineers to discuss them with their interaction at a moment in time when the role of engineering and architecture is more computationally defined than ever. But looking at this through a lens of art history, this is Beatrice Colavina looking at x-rays linked to um, Tia Schuller's use of thermal diagramming, uh, Frank Gehry's cold bending of steel, Stephen Hall's work with glass. But a question where we increasingly were trying to bring together a, a group of architects and engineers that could try to speak to the, 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 the very deep processes of analysis that were allowing some of these buildings that we've seen in the last 12 years to be produced. This image is uh, not gratuitous because of Obama, uh, President Obama, but he is standing on a stair designed by Dean Nordenson. Uh, that is George Soros standing next to him, sitting next to him, pulling the strings of these tension stare. But we are looking at things in engineer transparency, the photoelastic stress test, uh, the finite element analysis that he was using, the structural engineer, and the degree to which the role of that engineering is still at the level of a sort of uh, architectural theatricality. This stair is designed to present somebody still. It is not, it is not uh, despite its engineering, it still serves a very primordial architectural role. Uh, other aspects that, are more, that I'm looking at, and I'll try to show a little bit of it in my own architecture tonight. This is a Matthias Schuller diagram from an essay in Engineer Transparency, looking, it's a computational fluid dynamics diagram, looking at the airflow and the air temperatures in the Toledo Pavilion, and the degree to which these buildings are essentially organized at the level of, of air volumes, air capacities, and the thermal conditions of air. That is not new, but the degree to which it is controlled is new. Gene Ordenson's structural system for the same building, the isolation of shear in one steel section, and then the tenuousness of the rest of the frame. So I'm going to switch quickly into two housing projects and try to relate back to some of those concepts quickly uh, in a way that I would, would hopefully allow a bridging of, of that kind of speculation versus only around design. In 1996, uh, the Clinton administration uh, begins a process uh, essentially of, of creating the, the foundations and then the ultimate unfolding for the HOPE 6 programs in public housing. In Houston, during that period of time, the group of us were rarely were, were not involved with straightforward analysis of urbanism in terms of policy, economics, or law. We were all veering towards those questions and beginning to put our foot into the water. There was a wider speculation about the meaning of cities in relationship to architecture, but not much explicit in terms of actual policy and the underlying tenets of policy that had to do with these things. I started, had finished, had the book Slow Space well underway, almost complete, and began to listen and read carefully the policies around housing that year, and essentially began to try to examine what was happening with the outrage on some architectural circles that this is a low-income house, this is low-income housing in Houston, and the degree to which architects were starting to frame the debate about housing and architecture in relationship to things such as new urbanism, neo-traditionalism, uh, vernacular, and while the other side there were questions about modernism and a push towards innovation that they felt somehow could not be solved. Uh, there would be no resolution between the two, two camps. 
if you look closer at the policy issues that were starting to underlie these things, you could find easier ways to get at the issues. In 1996, uh, the, the Hope 6 program did start in earnest, and it did begin a kind of uh, a partial dismantling of public housing. Between 1996 and the year 2000, 100,000 units of public housing in the United States were dismantled. They, they were replaced with mixed income and higher income housing, and ultimately more housing units were produced, but the actual aggregate number of public housing units actually decreased. During that period of time, the architectural debates began were largely looking at what was happening with the outward appearance of things. This is the Reverend Harvey Clements, founder of the Fifth Ward Community Redevelopment Corporation, simultaneously founder of the uh, Pleasant Hill Baptist Church in Houston. This is a low-income house produced by his nonprofit uh, builder, the FWCRC. These are two houses produced by the University of Houston for the CRC with sweat equity by students. And this is what the Fifth Ward largely looked like even in the middle 1990s. What was happening under the Clinton administration in that period of time was that there was a move towards ownership, which we've all heard uh, more, than, more than we probably need to know about right at the moment, but there was also a move towards the use of vouchers to abet ownership. In 1996, the city of Houston was, was destined to, was uh, proposed that it would receive 25,000 down payment vouchers at the, at, at the level of $9,500 per house that would be distributed to families that might otherwise live either in rental housing or in public housing. During that period of time, the debate started to rage about what this would do to the city, what this would mean architecturally, what this would mean in terms of planning, and ultimately what it would mean in terms of demographics and issues such as race. Uh, the projection was that the low cost of land in downtown Houston would be a target for developers who wanted to build housing that would target and get these vouchers. Now, I put together an exhibition, and I'll refer to that in a moment, that tried to address some of these questions. But long before there was an exhibition, we produced a small little VMRL diagram of some of the assistance programs, just as a very rudimentary analysis, trying to get a grip on them architecturally. Uh, I was curious about what 25,000 housing vouchers might mean for downtown Houston. I was curious what this sort of house meant in the history of social housing, and, and was it a viable model? Uh, we began in looking at this by making a little chart that began at the top by modeling Habitat for Humanity. The second level down was the federal voucher programs and income levels for families that might qualify for a voucher. And by the time you got to the bottom, this was a mortgage that would go through something like Nations Bank or Bank of America. We made a little chart, basically, that was modeling house costs, family or household income, and levels of assistance and tiers of assistance. And we were trying to find out to make a little plastic diagram that would show which level worked the best for which income group. Now, at the level of housing that you would do with the vouchers or with Habitat for Humanity, you essentially could not get a loan, of course, the nation's bank. And, uh, but we used this diagram to talk to partners, galleries, fundraisers. We talked to several banks. We ended up talking to local initiative support corporation in New York. And basically, we're trying to say that there is a new space emerging within the policy and if you could model that space in some sort of visualized way, that, that it could become apparent and discussed more at a public level, that you could start to bring up a more sophisticated debate to the argument rather than neo-traditional or modern. And then we could basically try to break down that detente. The result, after about a year and a half of doing various modes of research, was inviting 16 architects uh, to examine a dossier and a brief that I assembled and sent to them and asked if they would design a house for the Fifth Ward CRC that could be realized within the aspirations of the transformed uh, housing laws. The group included uh, well-known architects uh, from around the country, but it also largely included architects who had either been in Houston, worked in Houston, or had some sort of aspirations about architecture's relationship to that type of city. Robert McMurray and Marianne Ray working with Eric Orr, Keith Crumbuddy, who had come from uh, SciArc recently, Carlos Jimenez, Si Chung Young, and Judy Chung, Lindy Roy, Albert Pope, and Catherine Bruner, uh, uh, Deborah Morris and Gabriela Gutierrez, Taft, Arch Taft Architects, uh, William Williams, Lars Larrick with Walter Hood, Bruce Mal, Sanford Quinter, Mark Womble, and Don Finley. I could go on, but the, the group essentially was given the economic data from what a Fifth Ward CRC
CRC house is built like, it's, a, it's actual budget, every piece of item in terms of aluminum windows, four inch slab on grade, how much for plumbing, how much for light switches, and then a broader dossier that was trying to examine the state of the Clinton era housing policies and the, the work to welfare programs of that period, the left to center goals. Um, each architect got a four foot by 10 foot table. We didn't use the gallery walls. This is a gallery in the Fifth Ward, a former warehouse, a nonprofit art gallery and performance space. And we made a proposal, not for a master plan, but instead for 16 houses that could be realized within the Fifth Ward CRC's aspirations. We gave the audience, we invited 500 people from the Fifth Ward, 500 people from the Houston art and architectural scene, and had a grand opening, and then about six different public events trying to discuss the results. There was no master plan. They were presented as options, and the options were, if you want this house, the CRC will build it for you. If you don't want it, choose another one. And the idea was that we would essentially evacuate the scene after those 16 houses. Now, the research that the architects were asked to look at, Clinton Hur public housing transformations under 06 essentially were moving the role of public housing more to normative builder situations. So public housing is no longer being built by the centralized government, but more by a distributed sort of consortium of normative contractors. Three to four stories tall, uh, type five construction if it's in California. We looked at 13, we looked at spec houses on the outskirts of Houston that had similar contractual relationships. 347 houses built on the outskirts of Houston for, uh, in 1996 for $16 million, sold for about $18 million, the architectural fee, $4,550, $13 per house, 0.0325% architectural fee. In other words, these type of housing practices, of course, we all know, do not involve us. So the move in terms of housing to scattered sites and decentralization essentially also atomizes, atomizes professional practice to the point of virtual non-participation. Over the period of time of owning a house, the voucher programs were intended to help people into ownership. The average house in Houston was sold every nine years during the 1990s. Over nine years, the equity uh, accrued on a $50,000 mortgage, $6,589. $354 a month. To get that equity, you spend $38,000. We know the mathematics of amortization. The value of the vouchers in Houston. The, the vouchers in Houston were projected that to be worth about $225 million as a block grant. During that year alone, $460 million in car sales were made in Houston. Nationally, $525 billion in car sales were made that year, or 500 Getty Centers. The Getty Center was a new story at the time. $225 million in aggregate value of 25,000 vouchers. This is 25,000 households targeted. They never reached that number. Eight miles of freeway in that year, $182 million, $22 million a mile. You can't compare freeways and houses easily. I'm aware of that. But we, were prepared, we provided the architects with a huge amount of data trying to contextualize the value of these systems against other infrastructural systems. And in a city that has, I think, the lane miles in LA versus Houston versus New York are actually relatively similar in terms of the amount of lanes but the use changes. But trying to create a scenario where the architects would not find an easy solution in terms of architectural styles, but instead would start trying to debate the nature of their work as an economic entity within the larger systems. And indeed, if you could only produce a small entity, how would it be compensatory, if at all? A house by Lindy Roy proposed a new interpretation of a shotgun house, uh, updated through, this was the exhibition version, this was the later version for construction, but with a type of humor that was still serious, Lindy's house had a front porch that became a lampshade for the street light. And she talked about the house essentially desiring to morph into the systems of infrastructure where it could gain more research and development if not authority. A, a, a house by Si Chung Leong and Judy Chung, a set of 10 houses actually, that could be dismantled and reassembled as families changed. It is an idea that is not new, but they have put a huge amount of rigor into trying to really make it possible to buy and sell parts over time and to, to contract your house. I think one of the most successful projects in that exhibition was also the most unbuildable under the normal situation. This 
is a project by Don Finley and Mark Womble for something called the Clip House. They actually proposed only that we build the, that they would only build this small metal bracket that binds together the green and the blue units. The colored units would be produced by high-end manufacturing with R&D capability. So their proposal was Microsoft, Coca-Cola, or Ford could produce these components. They would take the entire $225 million block grant, keep it aggregated, and produce a factory that could produce a, a sophisticated clip. So in other words, instead of trying to atomize the architect the funds into, into smaller construction systems and thereby degrading the architectural possibilities for research and development, they wanted to keep the funds aggregated but produce a distributed system of construction. Uh, everybody took it seriously. Nobody could imagine getting it actually done. Uh, my own project in the show, and Robert Hungarian walked into the opening and said I took the middle. <laughs> Uh, this is, I, I gave myself the middle spot, Robert. That's it. And uh, I had a conflict of interest. I was the curator director and I was in this as well. Um, it was called the Glass House in Two Degrees. I've shown the project here before, but it was a 980 square foot house that mirrored the exact footprint of a two bedroom spec house that they were building in the Fifth Ward. Also using the same four inch slab on grade, the same 50 by 100 foot yacht lot, and many of the same parts but replacing the, most of the skin of the building with a set of off-the-shelf sliding glass doors uh, using basic commodity sliding doors, Fleetwood for this case, but essentially trying to produce a, a house that would, in some sense, test the limits of the perimeter. The two-degree fold basically added a very microscopic amount of length because of the geometry of the, the hypotenuse rather than the straight line. And you see a two-degree fold here, two degree fold here, this is a straight line, two degree fold in, two degree fold out. The only custom parts in the building would have been a set of turnbuckles, a sort of a set of custom parts that would link the pre-manufactured parts. And I view the project as half monument, um, half commentary on historic glass houses, and half uh, acquiescence to the low level commodity procedures that go into spec houses in the United States and trying to produce an architecture that can speak to the idea that public housing was now becoming quasi-private housing and was thereby acquiring the attributes of, of, of private housing in the normative U.S. Um, we cut it right down the center of the lot. This little light well is about 18 inches wide and about 9 inches wide at this end but the sliding boards open onto an opaque wall. But trying to create scenarios where the most small moves would somehow create the most large benefit. And uh, at that point in time, uh, the property in the fifth ward was selling for $5,000 a lot. There were no aspirations for density. So if you would try to, if you would try to say that they should build higher density, uh, they essentially would, would argue right away back that it didn't make economic sense to do that. Um, I think it was pretty common to show your own hands in pictures at that point in time. This is a, a OMA. Uh, but this is showing really a, a sense that you would put a pressure on the corner of this house and a type of tension, and that the building would essentially spasmodically uh, fold and produce this asymptotic little extra piece of dimension to it. Later, uh, after the exhibition concluded, we actually raised $80,000 through the Local Initiative Support Corporation in New York to try to build some of these houses. We used the grant to pay a construction manager and, uh, and to work with us to bring seven of the houses which were chosen by a jury up to a level of constructability and meeting the budgets. Of those seven houses, one, one was constructed, Gabriela Gutierrez and Deborah Morris, uh, and I'll go into the details in a moment. Six of the houses at one point were pre-sold. The property that they were placed, supposed to be on, which is right here, this is I-10, which will come all the way to Santa Monica eventually. It's uh, actually running this, this way. And uh, this is Halliburton Brown and Root, right here. And uh, the property that was purchased by the FWCRC, the water main, was subpar. In the, in the year it took to get the water main changed, the six spec the buyers uh, decamped to existing houses that were already available and only one was constructed. It looks like a relatively affordable house. It actually was quite expensive in the end. The Pier Foundation was $12 a square foot. CRC houses were $4 a square foot at that point in time for the foundation. And the amount of surface area to produce an 1,800 square foot house was great because of the proportions. 
it was successful in a lot of other issues. In trying to get seven of these houses through financial conditions, every one of the architects actually met the budget requirements, which was about $100 per square foot at that point in time. None of the houses, however, could be constructed. Uh, the construction costs, I should say, for each of those seven houses exceeded its appraised value and also then obviously exceeded the mortgage value. We ended up getting a banker to step in who reappraised them to make them sellable. But the bottom line is when you try to change those, the architectural conditions in a neighborhood without comparables, you can't finance things. So we went through so many levels of, of analyzing this, and that's just a few of them. The lessons of that project for me had a lot to do with trying to create a scenario where you could bring architects into the debate at a much higher level and with much more information and bring them in earlier rather than later. Uh, as a model, that I think succeeded. In terms of the actual mechanics of the day-to-day -day politics of getting it built, we frankly didn't succeed. Uh, upon arriving in New York, and uh, I left uh, Rice after that, as that project was coming to a conclusion, we moved to Columbia, largely to take over something called the Housing Studio. They've had a studio addressing housing in Columbia for 30 years, founded by Kenneth Frank and Richard Plunz. Uh, when I arrived in New York, the Architectural League of New York asked if I would create a similar project for a piece of property owned by the city of New York. The project is uh, called Stateless Housing, that's my name, not theirs, but it was a piece of research and design that was funded by the Architectural League of New York and the New York Department of Housing Preservation and Development in the year 2000 and 2001. The land that they were asking me to look at is pointed to right here, it's called Harvard by the Sea. And if, if you know New York, this is the Rockaway Peninsula. It's part of Queens. This is Brooklyn and Manhattan, Staten Island down here in New Jersey and the Bronx up here. But it's a property that's on the far side of Jamaica Bay. You see JFK Airport right there. And here's the aerial photograph just of the peninsula. The Rockaway Peninsula is a tremendously interesting piece of New York. It is an 11-mile-long peninsula of 38,000 households. 13,500 of those households approximately are publicly supported or public housing, and they all fall within that one little strip there called the site. This is the aerial photograph of that. Uh, the Rockaway Peninsula dead ends into Queens and joins the mainland. If you cross the canal, you're in Nassau County, and you would head out Long Island to the eastern end of Montauk. And uh, this is essentially the westernmost end of Long Island. You're looking at a piece of property that was cleared in 1968 by the city of New York. It's 308 acres of land on the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, it is recently redeveloped in the last three years, but not completely. When it was first cleared, the proposals were, and I'll go into how it was cleared in a moment, the first proposals called for building 10,000 units of affordable housing. When it was finally, uh, the RFP for development was finally awarded in 2001, in the last months of the Giuliani administration, the proposal was now for 1,200 units of high income housing. So we have a complete reversal of, of political agenda here over 30 years. The land was the last official act of urban renewal in New York. It's the last piece of land cleared that would, that would have been called under the term slum clearing or blighted property. I won't go into exactly how they determine that today, but it, it wasn't different than the way that they had done that many times in the past. But it was essentially a scenario where the contentious development issues that followed over that period of time lasted 30 years while people fought out what should happen here. 38,000 units on the peninsula, 13,000 publicly assisted. This is the New York City Housing Authority. 30% of your median, of your household income is the rent. The Urban Development Corporation in New York City, uh, New York State founded in 1968. They built 32,000 units of housing throughout the state before ending, I think, in 72. And this is Mitchell Lama Housing, uh, cooperative owned housing subsidized by the state of New York to produce quote unquote middle income housing for New York. The land was owned by a fourth entity called the New York Department of Housing Preservation Development, which was essentially a receivership. It became the receivership organization after much default, of course, in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, at one point, the NYHPD was the largest property holder in New York and slowly trying to return that property to the market. Uh, black and white photos of the, of the cooperative housing. This is the New York City housing site. Uh, the site 
was not comparable in ways and in other ways it was very comparable to Houston. The fifth ward was 22,000 uh, uh, occupants. The average household income in the 1990s or 98 was $8,700 per year. It was a very poor neighborhood with a very rich social history and frankly a very sophisticated sense of internal support. There was quite a lot of, uh, of, of life that was quite healthy nonetheless in the fifth ward. The Rockaways were a different story. Uh, much larger scale, however, also the poorest neighborhood in New York and it was the highest concentration of poverty in the city of New York in 2000. You're seeing some of the ones are expected. The history of public housing in New York is significant and that's a lecture in itself. One in 12 New Yorkers live in public housing. There are 189,000 public housing apartment units in New York. 8.2% of the rental housing in New York is public housing. And this simple GIS drawing shows the distribution. Not much in central Manhattan or lower Manhattan, a great deal in northern Manhattan, the Bronx, central Brooklyn, Brownsville, and out to the Rockaways. Uh, and you can kind of see that distribution pretty easily through GIS. It's, it, is a, it is a very significant political and social history, and to a large degree, a very successful one in the sense that it, it, it operates until recently uh, quite well in terms of issues such as crime, physical health, and also degrees in which it's integrated into the larger city despite some relatively clear modes of isolation too. Um, looking at the Rockaways for the city, I quickly told them that before we design anything, we would want to go through some research projects. And we funded a research project at Columbia that produced a body of work that went to the HPD uh, prior to them writing an RFP for the property. Uh, these diagrams show the Rockaway Peninsula in the background. Median income, 220% in the white neighborhoods in the ponds and Breezy Point, 20% median income in the public housing sector and uh, housing types, etc. Relatively straightforward data to, uh, put through some visualization. Uh, less successful, but nonetheless interesting uh, experiments. You're looking at an Excel chart here uh, on the lower level and a diagram from it above. This is 1934 and 1937. By the time you get to this side, you are in 1996. This is a mapping of the provisions in the Wagner-Stegall Act, the, the law that outlined the funding for public housing, the Housing Act of 1937. But in mapping it, we were looking at different ways in which the legislation dramatically changed as under the Nixon administration, from how it's funded, how it's repaired, and, and how rent roles are set, et cetera, et cetera. And, and just using this to discuss motives and goals for the, for the HPD. Income by household, percentage of income spent on community, the wealthy get to work quicker and spend a, a far greater, a small, far smaller percentage of their income. Data like that, trying to spatialize information. And even down to the level of a, a photographer, I arranged a grant for a photographer to try to capture portraits of life in the neighborhood at that moment. And during that time, of the demise, uh, the erasal of the housing and, uh, and the eventual uh, reconstruction process, there were dribbles of affordable housing being built. And here you're seeing something built by our neighborhood FWCRC, a, a nonprofit builder building duplex family housing, but also the normative construction techniques uh, of, of developer housing. This is the Ocean Village Urban Development Corporation building, a precast concrete award winner in 1972 by Ed Logue. Uh, our project moved also towards questions of design. Uh, they wanted us to make preliminary proposals for how they could guide the team that would eventually win the project. We weren't commissioned to actually design the project in terms of building it. The city felt that they were going to get a subpar project through the normal channels of, of, of commissioning someone. What the city would have done in, 19, in 2000 was this. They would identify a builder in terms of a development team that included the developer and an architect and an urban planner. That team would demonstrate that they could build housing that would, that would essentially sell. The goal was to put higher income housing in the middle of the public housing arena to quote unquote dilute the poverty. The Quality Work and Housing Responsibility Act of 1998 helps make some of that a little more tenable in terms of discussing it publicly. The second goal was the city of New York would give the property to the development team that demonstrated the ability to get the project done. So we're talking about 308 acres of oceanfront land. 
uh, 80 miles away from East Hampton, 15 miles away from Central Manhattan, being given to a development team. The city felt they were going to get some form of a kind of developer architecture, and they were trying to find a way around that. We went through data sets and described those histories that I just described and many others. We also did planning and then some architectural prototypes and submitted it all as an ultimate report. The first proposal in terms of planning was to rebuild part of the roads for public access. Uh, the the north-south roads connect to the subway system. This is the A train and they serve a great deal of people coming from New York City who will go to the beach. So the north-south roads were rebuilt, but not all of them. Uh, we built and proposed a new set of uh, uh, roads in the east-west direction, completely open, but that would have a smaller scale and a more of a uh, neighborhood sense in terms of a little bit of privacy, but not closing the roads down. We tried to find a density that could work with all of the densities that were there in terms of the historic models and the fragmentation of them. The neighborhood to the north had 17 to 18 units per acre in bungalows and duplexes. The neighborhoods to the south, uh, west, had 125 units per acre in high-rise slabs. So we ended up proposing housing at 80 units an acre, down to 35 and 20 units an acre, and then finally all the way down to 18 to 7 units an acre in these bungalows that follow the street pattern. So to look at that in sequence, it was a matter of this property, first adding this density, then that density, and then that density, and essentially coming up with a gradient that would tie together almost all of the constituent elements. The other proposal was that the city was quite certain that there was going to be an envelopism that was sought by the new development team, and they were trying to stop that, but they weren't, but they didn't, other than through direct uh, vetoing it, they were trying to stop it more in a more subtle way. We were trying to find methods by which you could parcelize the land into very small ownership increments, but still keep it open. So these are stacked townhouses that go over the road. These are, this is uh, four different housing types on one block that keeps the perimeter open. And then finally you get housing that goes down to the scale of uh, small scale housing that traces the perimeter. One of the models is shown here uh, at the center of the site includes three ownership units, uh, live work, live work, and then the same model repeated four times for a grand total of 16 units. Um, and then finally, that same amount of housing replicated at a, at a tighter density for rental housing. So from ownership to rental on the same block and a diagram that would try to make it possible for all of that to occur without any kind of segregation. The walkway that goes down the middle of the entire site, and each unit is a flat with its own stair, which you're seeing here. So, and then finally, from a landscape architect point of view, the buildings left the, the seagrass and the natural soil open beneath all of the, the glass, not very tenable. So here you're seeing that, that walkway and up the stair. This is a flat, that's a flat, and this is a flat. Prefabrication systems were proposed. The buildings is a sort of structural truss that would have very light structure that comes down to the ground, so very light touching in the soils. And a view of the lit work units and the flats behind. And then a view of that stairway, the kind of mini boardwalk, with each apartment having a stair. So you get the density of, of you get a higher density, you get the privacy of ownership, you get the privacy of your own stair, but you do have collective apparatuses as well. And then much of the housing had a second stair that would take you out the south towards the ocean, back down onto the sand. And then the same amount of housing uh, packed into a denser sandwich. This is a duplex apartment right here. So you're seeing one, two, three, four apartments that fold through each other. And finally, a public services building, such as a daycare or a kindergarten, uh, folded into all of these buildings. And where we literally should try to show that that dimension becomes that dimension and then becomes that dimension with this increasing compaction. Retail, greenhouses at the ocean for the cold winters, different thematic drawings, and drawings that were, that were in some sense, trying to test different visual aspects of things we would go for. This at a humorous level, this is a structural truss sandwiches by two pieces of glass, uh, but we were really kind of making jokes about putting the rich behind bars uh, in the neighborhood. 
So, and here you can see the, the two apartment buildings linked by the stairway. Marble Fairbanks did the higher density housing higher than the one I just showed. This is the stacked townhouses with parking beneath. And then Mark Rakitansky Studio actually went through and did a survey of the existing buildings and houses in the neighborhood from this mansard roof, etc. And then proposed an architecture that essentially was composed of the different elements and techniques in those buildings. Um, I'm not thinking of switch here, but the, this is a 1968 cover of Time magazine. The breakdown of a city, questions about housing were central to the article, of course, as were countless other, other articles, the same issue. But also the, the counterpoint, and a Pulitzer Prize winning photograph. This is shown in the News Museum in New York in 2002. Back to it now, and I'm, it's my photograph of the photograph. But the kind of scenario where these stories were told through various mediatic devices, and rarely with the real intricacy that it takes to get work on them in a meaningful way, I think. The issues are absolutely here. This is 2004. This is Bush administration discussion of Section 8. This is the Bush administration uh, further discussing even things such as the Community Reinvestment Act was being uh, targeted for transformations in 2004 up into the deficits now, which all of the public housing issues are facing for the first time in some time. I'm going to skip by that, but that's the really time. Now, I had not worked on private houses in, in 10 years when uh, in 2003, a client approached me knowing the work I had actually done on Fifth Ward. And it was a, a scenario where something that had been designed for one situation was being asked to be replicated for another. Uh, the clients uh, asked for a private house and, and actually knew the work I had done for 10 or 15 years from having seen it published and followed it carefully and introduced themselves to me in that regard. One of the uh, two men, Richard Press and Philip Gefter, Philip Gefter at the, time, at, at the time was the photo editor for the front page of the New York Times. Uh, Richard Press was writing a script for a film called Virtual Love and proceeded to get quite a bit of notoriety for the, for the, for the script at Sundance and other places. But it was a project where two clients with immensely varied ideas about plastic space and architecture suddenly came to me and wanted to discuss doing a project that had none of these same social aspirations. But it was um, bathed in the techniques and vision that I had been using for some time. They purchased a 12-acre piece of property in Columbia County, two hours north of New York City. And we went up, and the typical architect client beginnings, we started to walk around the site and figure out what might happen. You can see us on the site imagining what's going to happen from the arrival versus once you're there. But basically, it was a discourse completely bathed in questions of architecture and vision from a photo editor and a filmmaker. The project picked up on all of the techniques I had been working on in terms of working on in terms of glass, in terms of organizing vision, and but was pushed very quickly uh, towards questions of realization and tight budgets. Uh, we started construction within a year of meeting and designing the building. Uh, we spent three years building this, and I'll talk about the questions of how a small building can take three years and what that means too. Uh, the, the building instantly had certain aspirations that made it, uh, made it, I think, a bit unique. The glass in the building was 12, uh, 14 feet wide by 9 feet tall. And with, these are jumbo IGUs. They weigh about 1,500 pounds apiece. The owners were pushing for a building that would take the glass, model, glass house model that we know, know quite well, but might start to push it dimensionally to a point where the panes basically spread to a point where you lose the peripheral vision and you start to get a curving of space to the side and a projection of your body in front of the plane rather than behind it. So you're seeing a, a, a massive piece of glass being put into a 2200 square foot house. There are eight pieces of glass that size in the building. The other issues that came from the past work were questions of layering all the way back to the house in the desert outside of Santa Fe, and questions of the background being pulled through the foreground, the foreground being pulled through the background, and a sense of destabilizing what you would call the inside. So a J-shaped house producing a courtyard, a south-facing courtyard for the cold winter, <coughs> a, a, a situation with two bedrooms and a small study at one end, 
a small study in the, in the east side of the building in a small dining room, and then a living room, dining room, and kitchen. A relatively straightforward diagram for domestic occupation, but in this case, two offices and an attenuated relationship between them. The building uh, was a sort of discourse about both the nature of being inside of it in terms of these massive IGUs, but also a relationship to both the Farnsworth House, Richard Marcha, Philip Johnson, and several other glass houses. The project ended up following a trajectory where north and south windows had a projected six inch window frame that held the glazing outboard of the structural frame. On the east and west sides, the glass was pulled to a quarter inch uh, inside the structural frame of the building. And indeed, the structural frame of the building became part window frame, while then window frames were produced here. And I'll go into that. There was always a sense in the building of these type of material histories and the tenuousness of building with glass that size. The glass produced horizontally and pulled as it anneals, the lifting of it into place and then the doubling of it into an IGU, 9.9 .9 pounds per square foot. And the questions of once it's an IGU, it has to stay vertical or else you'll lose the seal of the glass. The owners uh, brought up issues of Pons Namath's photo film of Jackson Pollock, the horizontality of a Pollock versus tilting it up to become vertical, and in Connie Greenberg's words, to become a painting. But the, the degree to which materials have histories of how they're made versus histories of how they're installed. And in a sense, could a building be a kind of repository of those histories? And indeed, once it's done, would you have an awareness of that? So they were deeply curious about it as a completed artifact, and they were deeply curious and involved with about conceptualizing how it was made. The property, 12 acres of land uh, across a right-of-way, badminton, uh, badminton racket shaped piece of property. You would come across an open field into a forest, and the land house ended up about right here. So there was this aspect of the arrival, the one quarter long mile driveway that would bring you up to the house. And seeing here a diagram of that arrival. This is the house. And the driveway coming up, and then a sweep to the side where you would slow down and then park and then approach the house diagonally into this corner bracket. Simple footprint. Now, they were initially planning on a rectilinear glass house. They wanted two studies where they could both be together but be as far away apart as possible. Sounds like a typical marriage, I think, <laughs> in terms of sometimes that home. So we ended, up with, we ended up essentially with a kind of topological twisting of the house. The single rectangle linear volume ended up being pulled this way. This volume ended up being pulled this way. This study ends up diagonally 28 or 30 feet away, but it's about a 97-foot walk on the inside. So the sort of elastic pushing of the interior. The building was arranged according to planes of glass here, 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 and here. And small switches in the surface in here, and then from back here to this corner, back, and then across here. Elevations look relatively normative for that kind of building. Foundations uh, showing the excavation of soil. There was a sense all along that the J-shaped building would put a downward pressure on the earth and that the center of gravity and the center of the experience of the building would actually be in this axis outside the building. So this diagram adding that sense of earth that fills in the gap between. And during the production of foundations, the backfill, essentially, where the building becomes a dam that's holding back the earth and folding it down towards the site beyond. So this is from the higher elevation. The earth comes rolling into the building, which basically dams it up and then stepping down all the way, this is the owner's looking at it, and then further down into the fields below. And finally, when things do start to get back filled, that sense of a, a Walter D. Marina earth roof in a way. This is the, the, the courtyard starting to be produced where the soil is almost at the exact same level as the floor. The roof, a flat roof, there was one datum that the building essentially would come down from rather than rise to. And ascent, this is an analysis that we were looking at holding the roof up with eccentric columns for a period of time and the strange uh, tensions that would have been in that. And renderings showing that ocular project from early on, which the owners were asking me to quote. Here's the bedroom. This is the other one. One study here, the other one over here. And then here you're looking through four layers of glass, or eight if you count the edges. Same here. 
diagonal tensions, the push and pull of the foreground and the background. The owner uh, recently reviewed Joanne Baerberg's uh, MoMA exhibition. Uh, he writes art criticism for the Arts and Leisure section as well. But uh, Baerberg using triptychs and altering the, the focus and the bellows of the camera as she moves it to produce the tip, 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 uh, triptych. This is the same technique we were using in the building. And histories of vision and indeed the Dodson Valley School was a question. Now, I'm going to flip through these quickly and get to the actual building. But uh, the owner was a photo editor seeking photorealistic renderings of the building prior to construction. We, we did our best to get the questions of reflection, a white wall six, 16 inches behind the glass, uh, 15 feet behind the glass, and then the plunge to the forest. But we were working hard to really model the experience for them. Six foot long hallway goes down to bedroom number one, bedroom number two. The entire building can be opened into one room. Uh, the doors retract on the inside to make it a singular volume. And here you see detailing of the structural scale of the roof versus the outboard channels that hold glazing systems. And then situations where the glazing folds into the building and underneath. Very straightforward structural frame. And finally, the results. Now, the, you're seeing a 12-inch deep channel that, that cups space in the east and west direction. So this is folding out this way. Tube steel runs in the north-south direction. And then you have an outboard system that holds the glazing six inches beyond with these framing systems. Concrete floors in one wing of the building, wood in the other. And a situation where you see this folding in, folding out, and all of the systems locking together at that corner. And it starts to come alive when you see people in it. One person in the courtyard, one inside, one person. This is the bedroom. And then at night, this Richard Barnes photograph of um, here, the doors are partially closed here and here. But somebody standing in the hallway, somebody standing and then looking in the other direction. These are uh, operable panels for, for ventilation. These are fixed windows. And situations where you can see how the outboard frame brings the piece of glass outboard of the structural column. This is a four inch by four inch wide flange. And the owner was, we were trying to get close to the Eames house wide flanges. And then the, the, those, the tube steel that holds the window systems, but scenarios where the glazing, because of its mass, its one and a quarter inch thick as a composite, starts to feel object-like and that it's held outboard of the structure. You, when you pass by that edge, you can sense it. Uh, living room, that's nine by 14 foot IGU. Everything pulled into the ceiling where we can to radiate meals. And I spent a lot of time at the Philip Johnson house over the last couple of years, including a day uh, spent with Philip Johnson in 99, 98. Uh, since spent a whole day sitting, sitting at the table just talking to him, fascinated by the house. But the house gets discussed often as not having great detailing. In fact, I think the detailing is extraordinary. But you'll see the windows are also outboard at Johnson's house. And the degree to which these kind of scenarios completely change how you read it. One study and the other. And then somebody working very privately versus somebody then looking completely the other direction but the immediate proximity. And then one person, negativism. <laughs> it's really, it really comes alive with use. Um, and then pulling back into the forest. This is the fellow working. Ceilings, which is the black, it's the black floor on one side of the building. Phil Johnson's bed after he passed away. Their bed. It's kind of really looking close. This is the Johnson corner with the flashing. We actually don't have flashing. And uh, seeing it at night, that's Paul Goldberger in the Johnson house. And then the Johnson house with the column directly engaging the window system. In our case, the window system is pulled apart uh, anywhere from three to one and a half inches, it varies. But that gap from a bedroom into the living room, that's the owner speaking to the contractor. 
and the way in which it essentially really dissolves because the window is folded into the ceiling and it folds below the floor level. Structural silicone holds everything flush on the exterior and you know, one piece of glass essentially producing an interior. Now, it took three years to build. It was largely made by hand. Almost nothing was prefabricated. The owner, the builder, largely built all of the steel systems on site. He produced a little metal shop. And you would see this kind of incongruous scenario of, of essentially you know, small cranes working in a forest. And the inconsistency of that was always something we were trying to sort out in our own imaginations. At times, the building looked like Southern California. Uh, the lightness of the frame here and the man on the small cantilever, but the very simplicity of it in terms of those systems, but then the slow thickening of it as a piece of architecture as it starts to gain all of this detail. The windows are glazed into that level, and then there's uh, insulation inside that steel in which the structure is still building. This is all being sandblasted before priming. These holes are for insulation. Here you get a good sense of the grinding of welds, etc transparency. Pretty rough image prior to sandblasting of those corners. And then finally the end result. I'll save that for another lecture. But the owner was, this is what the owner had asked me to do. And then they said, could you do this and also get the flatness of the glass plate? Inside the building? Outside the building? Not much difference? Inside? Diagonal views through the glass. The diagonal views, this is a construction meeting. And then scenarios where that structural frame comes up and is laced right into the drywall uh, and the way it disappears. The dining room table. of the handmade aspect of it, the, the, the ventilation system called for 50% of the perimeter to have forced air for backup heat if you got below 16 degrees for the radiant. The contractor built these 316 inch thick steel plates, uh, plenums. Uh, these are vents that would go down to a plenum. And then they were installed, uh, as you can see here, uh, to allow the, uh, the backfill of the concrete uh, sub, uh, structural slab before a topping slab. But all of this kind of handmade coordination, here you can see them putting one of those vents into the floor uh, prior to doing the, the backfill. And uh, the situation here, you see them suspended before. It was there, it was a really terrifying construction process. Radiant heat, slabs getting backfilled, and eventual uh, topping slabs, which are then done before any glazing and any of the real painting or finished work can be done. And then finally, hand work, cleaning up concrete, concrete and steel joints. So I was going to show one, two, two short uh, animations uh, to, to give us some. occupied now for almost two years and uh, it's this film is about discuss sensing that occupation. The drive the quarter mile driveway.
eight by sixty feet facing south and the issue is for the winter sun which gets a huge amount of solar gain.
projected speed limit to the wider New Jersey network. This is a proposal for 1,500 units of housing on top of the station.
I didn't hear that, I'm sorry. I was, was that a question about cost? To find out uh, what the cost per square foot of house in upstate New York is. You're not going to believe me. Um, <laughs> you're not going to believe me. It was it was about two hundred and seventy-five dollars a square foot. The house the, the house is two thousand two hundred and eighty square feet. The original but the original budget was four hundred and sixty thousand dollars. During construction, the owners pushed it up to about five hundred and forty with different add-ons. To be very frank, the builder went bankrupt. Uh, he couldn't afford to build it as original bid. A new builder completed it for approximately two hundred more thousand. But I want to say, in the end, it was close to eight hundred thousand dollars for uh, twenty-three hundred square feet. It was inexpensive. It was it was inexpensive for several reasons. One is the raw materials were developed to, delivered right to the site. Uh, the processing of there was a huge amount of land to to organize and store materials, and the GC did a lot of the work. It was just it was really it was really inordinately inexpensive. It goes from negative 11 to about 102. And uh, the, the mechanical engineer was Altieri Sieber Weber, who also did the Getty Center. Um, uh, Andy Seaborg did it personally because he was interested in doing it. But it, it, uh, there's no trouble heating or cooling it uh, in terms of you know, just getting it done. Although it took me a while to believe that. But the, it, had, it was designed with a geothermal system that brought it below the operating cost of a normative house. The geothermal system was not completed as part of, uh, part of a budgetary system. Uh, instead, we put in a Buderis high efficiency boiler uh, and the radiant heat is in, is in 10 inches of concrete. So there's a huge thermal mass. It ends up relatively efficient for a glass house, but it, it's not as good as a normal house. The geothermal is for the radiant? Or the geothermal was actually gonna be for everything, air conditioning and radiant. But the, the, glass, is, the glass has a low E coating, it's argon filled. And uh, there are other things, the, the trees were used, the, the passive cooling in the summer from the trees is tremendous, it works fantastic. In the winter, the solar gain also works quite fantastically. So there's, but the, the amount of calculation and engineering that went into heating and cooling it was immense in terms of just analyzation. But it's, you, you couldn't, I mean, I, I have no idea what it would cost to build in Los Angeles, but if you tried to build that now in upstate New York, you would be at more, I would think, a thousand dollars a square foot. But also, you know, there are things that are normal to architectural construction that I don't, I have a hard time believing these actually did as much for us as they, I think they did, but the entire perimeter of the building is glass. And after you prepared it, the building was closed in three days. So, and it, it's structural silicone, so, the, the, the silicone work to close the building in, I think, was $22,000. So, in other words, you, I mean, you know, architects are always trying to trace costs and to try to analyze what costs what. But there were different ways in which we tried to limit labor, and it actually worked. You've connected two types of work. One that's this. You've connected two types of work. One that's about. Um, your researcher that's really been looking at uh, social, political, economic issues, and one that's um, uh, more des uh, design-based, um, perceptual in particular. And um, I think one one generally is work worked on by architects who feel a ethical, moral obligation to a larger social issue. One that um, and the and the other. Uh, generally by an ethical responsibility as an architect who feels that that is what they should work on as an architect. And I'm wondering if you have a position about how, how the architect resolves those two ethical priorities. Generally one side is picked over the other. Sure, sure. Um, you know, I gave a lecture in Michigan not long ago and a uh, historian in the front row, uh, I, I'm embarrassed to say I don't remember her name, um, she made this, I mean, I can answer your question in several ways. Uh, she made a comment saying that the early moderns faced that all the time. The degree to which somebody like the Promissier would go from social housing to Bill of Garsh, uh, or Bill of Savoy. Uh, and so in that sense, I, I, I think these things definitely happen. There's no doubt about it. But uh, there's an aspect of this that does tie it together more succinctly than I, than I let on. 
In the 1980s, when the, when the Dia Center published a little pamphlet, a little book called Vision and Visuality, it was a collection of four essays and an introduction by Hal Foster. And one of them was Norman Bryson, who I was quoting. But the Bryson essay goes, it's an analysis of, of Sartre and otherness in relationship to vision. And the, he analyzes Lacan and Sartre in terms of otherness and distance between people. But he ends with this conclusion saying the real project that he's working on is how vision is a political cons construction and how otherness is, is, of course, a political construction. So for me, the house is a private dwelling. There's no way around that. The otherness that's going on there is the otherness between the owner and the contractor. The contractor went bankrupt. The owner spent more money than they wanted to. The architect, I was other to the entire situation because, you know, as architects, you have limited control over negotiations. And then it was the otherness of the two owners, meaning they had similar goals. I'll work here, I'm going to work here. That's all part of it as well. But, and that doesn't get you to social housing or to the, to the New Deal or any of those questions that are on New York City Housing Authority sites. But what I think is, laces it together for me, and I feel more strongly about this than I used to, is I'm, if you wanted to try to reconstruct cities through hardware, if you looked at Los Angeles or Houston or Queens and saw problems and you thought you would legislate money to change things, that would be trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. I think what I find much more tenable, at least for the moment, is questions by which you can alter and you can use architecture as just one of many means to start to discuss ways of seeing it differently. So in other words, instead of reconstructing it, you begin to understand it. And once you understand it, you are not as alienated by it. And everything that, there are many more layers to the housing work I was doing, but the Houston work was very invested in, in participation and discussion and sharing knowledge. The New York work was not. It was large in format, you know, thousands and thousands of people involved. But I think one of the questions is just the degree to which you begin to understand the environment and then people are empowered to discuss changing it themselves. So as much as I can design all day, and I am like any other obsessed architect that way, I'm really also interested in the idea that other people would design. And that was the goal. In, in Houston, I didn't do my own, I did my own project, but I was thrilled by the idea of doing my own project with 16 other architects, 15 other architects. And then the idea that they, they were discussing it with the neighborhood. But I, I hear you, it's not, it, it will never go together that easily. You know, private clients for glass houses do not go together perfectly well. With, with low income housing, they just don't. <laughs> so. Yes. Well, I had um, I had a question over. Um, I, oh, sorry. Hi. Um, yeah, I had a question over the, the this film sequence you just showed about your students over in Colombia, and uh, I, I've seen similar the designs. Some of them, um, the, the hexagon shaped and all that. What is the style? What, what, is, the, is that a movement or sorts or like repeating designs again? Because um, over here in LA, at USC, um, I forgot the chairman's uh, the chairman of. Uh, of architecture over there. He runs Metaspan, which is a firm in China and is designing these experimental um, buildings similar to yours. And I wanted to know, yeah. yeah, is that a movement or is it just plain practical sense that it's being devised? And that, that's a good question. There's no simple answer to that, but uh, you know, I, I think Columbia, like almost any architecture school, has, has some amazing experiments that happen, and they also have plenty of trends, and, and plenty of superficial things happen as well. Uh, that, that hexagon structure, I, they were sincerely trying to come up with a structural system that could, that could model that, that folding landscape. Some of those things indeed are a trend and part of the school. But I think a, a funnier and yet also more sincere reaction in that work, one reason I want to show those projects is to a large extent, they're quite diagrammatic. And I like to tell people that my students are doing very interesting diagrams of how housing could be produced, but they're not necessarily doing great architecture. And by that I mean that was illustrating a structural goal. So the hexagon was a structural project. They were also trying to turn it into a surface project so that you could have a park on top of it. 
and then they were trying to turn it into a glazing and a light project by putting glass into it in certain places. In other words, they're, they're following these legitimate architectural histories, structure, glazing, surface, but at the same time, some of it is dramatically exaggerated and completely silly structurally, and they often don't see that. So it's not just being students or being architects, it's, um, I think it's a scenario where a lot is going on in the way architecture, sometimes when it becomes quasi-urban, I think sometimes it becomes more diagrammatic, it gains urban intelligence, but sometimes I think loses a lot of architectural intelligence. That was a very rudimentary structural system, that's the bottom line. But they were amazing kids, they were thinking hard about what's possible. Just for fun. Back to the intro. I'll tease you. Yeah. Um, and then there was a, a question that came up a moment ago about the, the, the dichotomy between sociological, political, public policy aspirations in yeah. the last building you showed. That's, that isn't necessarily a conceptual problem. That's because what you've done, I think, which is, which is your decision, and other people share this, You've turned something that in the teens, in the 20s, Riedfeld, futurist, constructivist, Athens charter guys, they make cars that way, they make houses that way, they sort of model T argument, which has become now in a stylistic way, it's taken on other qualities, I think, and the intentions have changed. So you're making something, and the way you photograph it in, in an exquisite way, in an austere way, and in a precious way, that ain't the Model T. It's something entirely different. And, and even when you, when you talk about it, I remember Futagawa did the, the piece of uh, the Farnsworth House, when, when GA used to do it, I think they still did it with, with the details. But, and and in, in the fascination of assembly, I mean, there are people who don't grind the welds. You leave it. You go on to the next 16 guys. So, so to some extent, what you've got is what you made. And what you made in an abstract sense belongs to a history that we all know. But that history never arrived in the hands of the sort of leftist characters or the Hannes Meyer types, you know, those characters. It, it was argued for by them, but it never arrived for that constituency. It, all, it, it, it always belonged to a relative, I mean, Loitre stuff, same, same kinds of thing. So it's, it's, it's an irony, it's an old one, that what began as the Model T became this, this, this other kind of Tiffany's job. And I think a lot of that belongs to the author. That's, I, I, I do understand what you're saying. It's, um, I mean, to put a little humor in it for a moment, I, I, when that house was halfway complete, I ended up showing it during a lecture. And someone came up to me afterwards and said, you're building a goddamn Ferrari. And, uh, and, and he wasn't happy about it. And uh, so it was the handmadeness as opposed to a, a boxer, let's say. Yeah. But, but the other side of it was, I mean, a couple things in one. Uh, architecture, for a period of time, as it was looked at through Tafori, Manfredo Tafori, uh, you know, frequently painted himself into a kind of corner in which architecture needed to act but couldn't act. And you know, you would, the Karl Kraus situation, stand up and be silent. And I, I, if you listen to, uh, if you sit with Kenneth Frampton, he'll, he'll say, you're, by God, man, you're testing the limits of architecture. Don't you know this is going to be solved in Kalkal? I didn't mean yeah. so, no. Yeah. no, I know. But the reason, though, I mean, in a very sincere way, what, what I would rather come across is an idea that the material attributes of grinding or not grinding those welds, or the choice of windows that are one and a quarter inch versus one quarter or pre-manufactured aluminum, 
that all of those choices have behind them material and financial histories that also then have social questions. So, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I went to school at Berkeley in the 80s, and you know, we, we didn't have to look far to LA to see you and Frank Gehry and Robert and Marianne and, and uh, uh, Frank Israel and others, Mark Mack. Uh, questions by which people were picking things up from, I guess there was a Home Depot then, but a scenario where you would basically drive down the road with your own truck and come back with an aluminum window or a piece of plywood. So I always saw that as a, I'm not trying to put the argument back in your lap, Eric, but it was always a matter of a, this kind of moderated relationship to pre-produced, often low-level commodities. And the, and the attenuated assembly of the, you know, well, and, I, yeah, yeah, but, I would, well I would, that house well. does it. That, I think you, if you're saying that I'm the author of that house and that and that grinding of the welds is the author, I think you're absolutely right, and that's really useful for me to hear. At the same time, I'm, I'm thinking that house got produced over this three-year period of time by a builder, to be, uh, be totally frank, he was often doing things out of sequence because he didn't have the money to do the next sequence. Cash flow issues. And he would find himself walking around and wanting to be productive, and he had a fine eye himself. So he would start doing things that were not in the specs, such as grinding all of the welds. So uh, some of it was a matter of uh, the two of us essentially sliding down that together. But it's, um, in the terms of the larger social question, I'm much more interested in, if you think of the fascination with fabrication right now, I don't know if it's waning here, I think it's waning in Columbia, but you know, digital detailing, et cetera. Um, what, what always often worried me about that was the degree to which some of that fascination did not also simultaneously uh, produce a fascination with questions of volume or space or any number of other architectural stories that the ability to produce something digitally became the story. So it's a way of saying that, that all of those projects that I've shown that I think are trying to go back and forth between some sort of Framtonian tectonics, some sort of Southern California tectonics, you know, in terms of what was called the Santa Monica School maybe, and and then trying to look at it in terms of other lenses. It, it's, it's, it's all, it's, it's all in between. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's not so much a critique as it is, I think when you talk about the LA stuff, I think, yeah. I think there's something which is extremely disingenuous about all of that. All of the pulling stuff, you know, the off-the-shelf argument, all belongs to very early discussions. Sure that have nothing to do with Los Angeles. It probably started in Europe in a context which is more social and political. And as your friend Philip once said, crossed the Atlantic Ocean and deposited the sociology sure. in the sure. deep blue sea. Sure. It became a kind of stylistic argument when it arrived in Farnsworth and New Canaan and, and, and so on. And I think to some extent that was part of the LA discussion. I'm not sure it was, it, it's ever been argued that way, meaning it belonged to a different context and it was reapplied to something that, that in a sociological sense was, was antithetical to where it started. I, and I'm saying the same thing about Yeah, no, I, you know, I, I find myself very comfortable with, with the concept of, of the Paracons, so. Where, where you literally think about who's producing the building and what is their life like when they punch the clock and leave. I, that's like the contractor was under severe financial duress. There were times they couldn't afford to get to work. And uh, you know, you, you can watch this. And, uh, and then you know, finally things were refinanced and people reestablished an economic context to go forward that was equitable. But, but it, it, was, it wasn't just the building being underbid, it was the gasoline went up to $4 a gallon and they couldn't fill their trucks. So all sorts of watching that was very, very complicated, even on the little house. Well, thanks very much. Yeah. That's it. Thank you.